All right, friends, if you want to grab your seats, we're going to get started with the last part of day two of the Waste Management Symposium. How good's the playlist been today too? It's been just so many good songs. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm here for waste management information and a good playlist. Both of those things have been, have been great today. Uh, our last presentation of the day, uh, everyone before we break and then have our half day tomorrow, uh, joining us through Zoom and the wonderful world of technology, we're going to have a presentation on behaviour change and EPIC program 2020 with Kim Borg and Ricky Herzberg from Plastic Oceans Australasia. Now, can we have a round of applause uh, for Kim and Ricky? And just checking, Kim and Ricky, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Well, let's just double check that we can hear you. Give us two seconds while we press a couple of buttons. I make it sound like I'm pressing the buttons, but it's actually Michael. He's, he's across everything. He's doing a really good job, by the way, as well, I think. I would try again. Do you want to say hello, Kim and Ricky? Hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. Ooh, can this you is your us? first challenge, Michael. <laughs> I, I can feel it's fine. <laughs> I, I, I trust Michael to have a solution for this in, in no time. I trusted him enough to do the sound at my wedding. That's how much I trusted him because um, I, I was definitely not pressing any buttons at my wedding. I was a little intoxicated as most people <laughs> are. Um, not that I had to be drunk to get married. That doesn't sound right. My husband's delightful. It was just, um, well, it might be now. I feel like comedy is part entertaining audiences and free therapy for me. So... <laughs> <laughs> Some people probably know my husband. It's it's a small enough community that that is probably a thing. Uh, Michael, how are we going? It's fine. I, I can keep talking about Paul if we want to. Keep, he's a civil engineer, so that might explain a bit. What's he like? Very, very rational. Incredibly practical. What's that? A very good balance for me. Although challenging can I, can I tell a I can tell a joke I'll get away with it we'll see what the audience uh, I'm going to do it anyway <laughs> as an example of how practical he is I asked him if we should um get more adventurous in the bedroom and he asked for a risk assessment first <laughs> and I wish that was just something I wrote down but that was an actual conversation so, uh Kim and oh, Ricky I, have, yeah. we got, have we got audio from oh we got this audio is, this is fine. I can practice for Friday night. It's great. Can you hear us? No. He's he's a delight. So you can't hear us. I, I still haven't worked out the appropriate PPE gear for like <laughs> what he's after, but <laughs> oh yeah, was there a question? <laughs> High risk and low risk, yeah, it's always, yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're trying for a kid at the moment, if that's a more context. So, yeah, the, the high risk, definitely high risk. But it has made me realise that we're complete opposites. Like, I like going out, he likes staying home. I like spending money, he likes saving. I like romance and spontaneity. He enjoys tracking my ovulation cycle. <laughs> On an Excel uh, spreadsheet, it's... um. Wow, a lot of information here. <laughs> oh, good. I'll take that as a compliment then. That's fine. <laughs> it's good enough for that TV. Means you can, hear, oh, can you hear me? That's how you know you've done well in Darwin. You're, you're good enough for the telly. Sick. <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> it's a free show. It's great. It's awesome. Amy, <laughs> live in a hotel. Um, I, I can plug my show. There's only 10 tickets left if anyone's looking for something to do on Friday night. Only 10 tickets left. It's going to be great. I'll talk more about Paul. I'll tell some stories about my dog. Um, I mean, yeah, I could practice the entire show. It goes for an hour, which is what we've got for this presentation now. So, <laughs> oh, I could buy the 10 tickets, except... That would be really soul destroying, wouldn't it? Ten tickets left, I'll just buy them myself. Can we buy? Tickets? I have done that before. I'm not above that. Um, uh, two more minutes, easy. All right. What else have I got that's appropriate? <laughs> oh yes. 
Oh, good. I was just about to say something that would, that's not for this audience. The sun, it's not working yet. It's working now. Yeah. Michael's not going to do that to me. Ricky, can you speak for us? Yeah, I was asking if I could buy one of the tickets. <laughs> oh, can you flawless. Can you, yeah, can we you can hear, hear you now. That was the perfect timing. I was going through the rest of my set thinking the sun is too high in the sky for any of that material. And they have not been to the car yet. <laughs> no, no, the, the, only, the only challenge I have is that I'm stuck in Melbourne and I don't think I can get to you. That's all right. If if the borders open for next year's comedy festival, I'll bring the show there and I'll I'll hit you up. Fantastic. Oh, sounds great. <laughs> well, Ricky, we can hear you. Is Kim there as well? Or yes, Kim? I'm here as well. If you can hear Ooh. me. Yeah, we can hear both of you. This is this is Just a mysterious voice. Happens. Yay! <laughs> this is amazing. Well, Darwin, let's put our hands together and welcome Kim Borg and Ricky Herzberg from um, Plastic Oceans Australiana. Thanks, all Amy. over you, friends. Thanks, Amy. Thanks so much. And I, I know you have got very hot weather there today. We're kind of jealous because it's horribly, miserably cold, windy, rainy, and has been all week in Melbourne. So we're pretty envious of you with the sunshine. I think someone said it was over 30. So, you know, it, we're looking forward to some sun rays and we're looking forward to being able to go more than five kilometres because we've been in lockdown for like three months. So we're a bit over it, a bit over it. We would have been there with you if we could have been. So... There you go. Um, so it's my great pleasure um, today to um, uh, Kim and I co-hosting this presentation for you. It'll take an hour. Um, we've got a few um, exciting little bits mixed in there to make it uh, very interactive and interesting for you. And obviously at the end, we'll also of course do a QA and a for you to ask us some questions. Um, I just thought I'd introduce Kim to you. Um, Kim is a research fellow at Behaviour Works at Monash uh, Sustainable Development Institute, which is here in, in Melbourne. And she has over 10 years experience in behavioural research, which is hence the reason why I actually invited Kim to join um, the Plastic Oceans Australasia Technical Advisory Panel. And Kim's been working with us and we've got a team um, under our science research section of the business. Um, she's one of the, uh, the selected expert panel uh, members and does a lot of work in behavioural change in particular regarding she's just been working on a thesis for um, single use plastic. Hence, because of the program and the work that we do and this particular program I'm introducing later, which I'll be talking about called EPIC, it worked in really well for this latest data that Kim's got at hand for us to segue it together because I think you'll find it very useful and um, tells a story for you about why we wanted to share it with you with the councils um, in Northern Territory. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Kim and I'll come back later. Awesome, thanks so much, Ricky. So to get us started, I'm gonna introduce the problem with plastics and I'm gonna say something a little bit controversial. And I know Ricky almost had a heart attack when I said this yesterday, that plastic itself is not necessarily the problem. And by that, I mean plastic as a material has many great qualities. It's versatile, it's flexible, it's durable, waterproof, and it's cheap to make. It's also been really useful in certain industries like healthcare, hygiene, food safety, not to mention prolonging the life of perishable foods, which helps us cut down on another waste scourge, and that's food waste. But because of all these wonderful qualities, plastic has also been adopted across a whole range of single use, unnecessary items. And these items are particularly problematic because of what plastic's wonderful durability. And because of that, it has an exceptionally long lifespan. That means that plastic takes hundreds of years to break down. And in the meantime, it breaks apart into tiny pieces that are still plastic. And this is particularly an issue when it comes to single use items because they have this incredibly long lifespan but an incredibly short use span. So plastic bags, for example, are used for an average of about 12 minutes, and then they might be reused once or twice as a bin liner or something else, but they're ultimately discarded as waste. 
Now, when plastic is discarded as waste, it ends up really in one of three places. Number one, it is recycled. And as you can see here, only about 9% of plastic actually gets recycled. Part of that is because not all plastic can be recycled. And part of it is because plastic as a material doesn't actually have a very, uh, sorry, recycled plastic doesn't have a very big market value. So if no one wants to use recycled plastic in their products, then there's no incentive for us to create more recycled plastic as a material. Now, 12% of plastic is incinerated. And this one probably sounds like a better idea than it really is. So plastic takes hundreds of years to break down, but as it breaks down, it does release CO2 because it's made from oil and gas, which are fossil fuels, which means when we burn it, we're releasing that into the environment very, very quickly, contributing to, of course, climate change. And that doesn't get to the bulk of the issue, which is that 79% of plastic waste is either ends up in landfill or it ends up in our natural environment, where it poses a significant threat to a whole range of different marine life and ecosystems. Now, on a global scale, plastic waste is increasing every year. The figures I have here are from 2010, and I just want to draw your attention to a couple of them. First of all, it's estimated about 275 million tonnes of plastic waste was generated that year. And each year that number is growing. And of that, around 8 million tonnes is estimated to enter the marine environment. Now, more recent figures suggest that if you include fresh water as well as marine ecosystems, data from 2016 suggests that between 19 and 23 million metric tonnes of plastic is entering aquatic ecosystems. And in fact, it's been estimated that by 2050, there is going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight, which is pretty scary. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Well, that's a global scale. And in the global scale, Australia's not a big player, surely. And in a way, you'd be right, because we only contribute only contribute 3 million metric tons of plastic waste per year. But if you look at that on a per capita basis, we are actually one of the worst offenders. I did some quick and dirty maths and estimated on a population of, you know, 25 million, that works out to roughly 120 kilograms of plastic waste per person per year. That means I'm generating twice myself every year in plastic waste. Now, what I've got here are some of the most common items that are found during litter cleanups in Australia from the National Litter Index. And what you may notice is that pretty much all of these items represent single use items. There's bags, balloons, food wrappers, cutlery, straws, food and beverage containers, and the infamous cigarette butt. So what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, the good news is there are solutions and there are quite a lot of them. Some of those solutions are technological or structural solutions. So by technological, I mean things like biodegradable alternatives to synthetic plastic or finding organisms that consume plastic like the wax moth caterpillar. Now these seem like good ideas, but they are expensive, they're slow and they can divert the problem elsewhere. So compostable or biodegradable alternatives, for example, when they break down, they produce methane, which is another potent greenhouse gas. Structural solutions include things like improving waste management and improving recycling rates. But again, they have their drawbacks. So sending all plastic waste to landfill is still pretty problematic. For one, it's expensive. And two, if we fill all of our landfills with plastic, which takes hundreds of years to break down, we are going to be wasting our land for landfills, which is kind of ridiculous. Now, reusable alternatives are another option, great option, but again, there's still the challenge that for them to be effective in offsetting single-use plastics, we need to get people to actually use them. Now, for anyone who's familiar with the waste hierarchy, which I'm going to say most people in this room probably are, the first step is to focus on avoidance. And the same goes for plastic. 
We want to keep plastic out of the waste system as much as possible. And to do this, we can employ behavioural solutions. As part of a broader system change, behavioural solutions can help us do things like encourage the use of reusable alternatives, like bags or food and beverage containers. And they can help us avoid unnecessary items like straws. Now I've just said behavioural science to the rescue, but what am I really talking about when I talk about behavioural science? Now, as Ricky mentioned, I work for Behaviour Works Australia at Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And we treat behaviour change as an interdisciplinary approach. That means we will borrow from any discipline that looks to explore or change human behaviour, including psychology, sociology, communication, behavioural economics, whatever. But we ask the question, how can governments, businesses and communities encourage people to change their behaviour for environmental, social and economic benefits? So this is essentially what we do at Behaviour Works. Although I do want to point out that behavioural science is not a silver bullet. There is no one size fits all option. Every problem has a different solution. But at Behaviour Works, we use something called the Behaviour Works method. And this is how we approach all our behaviour change challenges. Step one is to understand the problem and the system surrounding it. Who are the key players? Which organisations are involved? Which individuals? What are the physical or societal structures that enable or hinder the desired behaviour? Once we understand that, we can then be very specific in what and who we want to change because we want to know ultimately what are the drivers and barriers to engaging in the desired behaviour for your target audience. And by that, I mean someone living, you know, a retiree living in rural NT is going to have different drivers and barriers to a young family living in the city area. The final step is to then develop your intervention, your message, your program and trial it. We can trial it, test it, evaluate it, change it to make it better. This is one of the most crucial but often forgotten step if we want to really create lasting large scale change, because this step will help others learn from what we do and adapt their own interventions for their own needs. Now in practice, you might be thinking, as most of us do, that we just need to educate everyone. If we tell everyone about the problem, then they will stop using plastics. They'll do the behavior we want them to do. But as summarized in this quote, information isn't really necessary and it can actually be irrelevant for decision-making. Now, just think to yourself for a moment, who knows that plastic waste is bad for the environment? I'm hoping everyone does, because I just told you it was. <laughs> But do you live a plastic free life? I've been studying this in detail for three years now and I'm still guilty. I still include plastic in my life. Now, part of this comes down to something called the intention action gap. That's where I have every intention to avoid plastic as much as possible, but I can't always do that because there are other barriers in the way. And what information can do is increase my intentions but it doesn't necessarily speak to some of those other barriers. Now, that doesn't mean education campaigns don't have a place to play. What campaigning can do is increase the public visibility of an issue. It can make us more open to other interventions, including policy options, and it can signal information about social norms. That's the unwritten rules of acceptable behavior, which I will come back to shortly. Okay, so we know there's an intention action gap. How do we bridge it? Well, when intentions are high, this is where something called nudge can be really helpful. You may have heard of the term before. Essentially, these are non-intrusive interventions where people still have free will, they still have a choice, but they are gently nudged towards the desirable behavior. Some examples from the plastic space include things like financial incentives and disincentives. So Starbucks in the UK trialed a five pence surcharge on disposable coffee cups in cafes. So five cents, I don't even pick up five cents on the street these days. 
And that little change resulted in an increase in reusable cup use of 126%. Another type of nudge is something called a default. So changing whatever the default behavior is because people generally don't like change and will just go with whatever the default is. In Japan, they trialed this in supermarkets where instead of handing out a free single use plastic bag to every shopper, they simply asked every shopper if they wanted a plastic bag. And that small, completely free change in practice decreased single use bag use by 40% over six months. And then there are prompts. So prompts remind us about our intentions and they help us avoid the I forgot problem. Because when it comes to reusables in particular, forgetfulness is one of the biggest barriers we have. Now the key with prompts is they need to be in the right place and at the right time. So if we think about reusable bags at a supermarket, if you have a prompt at the cash register, remember your reusable bags from your car, that's too late. I'm already in the store, I've done my shopping, I'm not gonna abandon my trolley to get my cars. I probably should, I, I probably would, cause I'm weird. But if we have those same prompts in a car park where people have left their car, about to enter the store, see the sign, they're only a few meters away from the car, it's easy to go back and get the bags. Now nudges are great if opportunity exists, but what do you do when it doesn't? Well, then you create it. So product sharing schemes are a great example of this. Monash Borrow Cup is an example of a product sharing scheme where students and staff can come to campus, borrow one of their reusable cups from a participating cafe, drink their coffee on campus, and then return it to one of the borrow cup bins. It's then washed in an industrial dishwasher and goes back into circulation. It's basically the same as a ceramic mug that you would use in a cafe. It's just that it can travel outside the cafe to the rest of the campus. Now this will work really well on a university campus, but as I said before, different problems need different solutions. So it may not be as effective in a different environment. Another option is to make those reusable alternatives as convenient and easy as possible to clean, to carry and to use when it comes to enablers of single-use plastics, the biggest one is the convenience factor. So a couple of examples I've got here include a metal straw that is not only collapsible, so it becomes nice and small and neat, but it also attaches to a keychain. And presumably you're in the habit of leaving the house and grabbing your keys, we'd hope, which means you don't have to explicitly remember the straw. It comes with you with an existing habit. Another option is having a collapsible reusable cup instead of the big solid ones, taking up less space in a bag, a backpack, a handbag, and just making it a bit more convenient for people. Now, my research, I've been specifically looking at some of the predictors of plastic avoidance behaviours. And I did a survey with a thousand respondents where I asked them about their own behaviour, about the behaviour of others, so what they thought other people were doing, and about their beliefs when it came to some of the benefits and barriers to avoiding single-use plastics. And what I found was that even when I was controlling for the other factors that are appearing in my little pyramids here, so controlling for age, controlling for environmental benefit beliefs or self-efficacy, so that's your, your confidence in your ability to do the behaviour, in this case, avoid plastic. So even when I'm controlling for all these other factors, the most important predictor of both behavioral intentions and reported past behavior was perceptions about others' behavior. And that's called a descriptive social norm. In other words, the more people believed that others were avoiding single-use plastics, the more likely they were to avoid themselves. As I touched on earlier, Social norms are the unwritten rules that guide and constrain human behavior. And this comes under two different beliefs. One of them is our belief about what everyone else is doing. That's called the descriptive norm. What do we see? What's happening around us? But then there's also something called an injunctive norm. And that's around what others approve and disapprove of. 
Now, in reality, we don't know necessarily what everyone else is doing or what they approve of. If you think of it at a state level, we don't know what everyone in the Northern Territory is doing or what they approve and disapprove of. But our perception about that still influences our behaviour. And those perceptions are influenced by a number of different environmental cues. So that includes the physical environment. So are there signs or policies in a cafe which promote reusable cup use? It also includes the social environment, most obvious one. Do we see other people carrying single use bags or reusable bags? Do our friends think we're strange for bringing a reusable container to a takeaway shop? Or do they pat us on the back for it? What are the social sanctions that go with that behavior? And then there's the symbolic environment, which includes marketing, campaigns, as well as mass media, which includes documentaries about plastic pollution, like A Plastic Ocean, that Ricky will take us through shortly. Individuals, businesses, and governments can help to change the social norms surrounding single-use plastics. They can do this by increasing the visibility of the desired behaviours, so refusal, avoidance, and reuse, through being a role model, being a behavioural role model to others, but also by creating avoidance opportunities where they don't exist and sharing good news stories, positive information about others' behaviour where others are doing the right thing and avoiding plastic. At the end of the day, everyone can help to normalise plastic avoidance. And I'm now going to pass over to Ricky, who's going to take us through a program designed to do just that. Thanks, Kim. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Kim's work is really um, informative and I think it's an eye-opener for, for many of us that always um, think that it doesn't really matter and we'll just, you know, chuck it in the bin, no one's looking. And I, I think that, you know, we've come to the point, particularly because of, we call it in uh, here at Plastic Oceans, we call it the plastic pandemic. Um, you know, the social norm is that we can actually make a difference by sticking to our guns of what we started to do already three or four years ago. What Kim's been talking about, you know, about the reusable cups, about the reusable, you know, or even eliminating not even using straws and the plastic bag now, you know, cloth bag or reusable bags. That has very much, it was, you know, becoming the social norm. Uh, and with um, COVID, a lot of that's kind of gone out the window. We've had to really um, remind people that there's still a lot that you can be doing because the amount of plastic waste from the PPE and what's happening, particularly in um, down south here in, in um, the Eastern States, not where you are so much in Northern Territory, but it's just really, really escalated. And um, it's, it's becoming uh, a real issue, even just in the first couple of months of us all being in lockdown here, that the increase in the amount of plastic that was appearing in the waterways and the storms, storm water drains and out on the roads and in the uh, walking in the parks. It was just, um, it's just been exponential. So anyway, a few years ago, Plastic Oceans Australasia um, created a program called EPIC and I'm gonna be talking to you about that in detail. And it really talks a lot and goes into the actual um, mechanics of how we deliver um, a solutions-based program using science, um, technology and evidence-based data to reduce this waste. Uh, and as uh, Kim was saying earlier on, you know, it is indestructible um, and uh, very, very difficult to get rid of. Kim, can you go to the next slide for me? So who are we? Um, Plastic Oceans, Australasia. We're part of a global alliance originating in 2009 as one of the first solutions-based plastic awareness organisations. We launched actually uh, three years, just over three years ago in uh, Parliament House in Canberra, 2017. Uh, and we, we actually, our claim to fame or what, what we were known for in the beginning was the movie, the movie, full feature length movie called A Plastic Ocean, as Kim mentioned earlier on. And that movie was the first of its kind globally to actually raise awareness of the issue and visual impact. Um, as they will say, you know, a, a picture 
speaks a thousand words and majority of people are visual and we take things in visually. So what I thought I would do, the movie is very long. You can watch it free on Netflix. And I hope that after you see what I'm going to show you in a moment, if you want to watch it uh, at home, please, by all means, um, you know, feel free to do that. I'd, I'd, love, I'd love you to watch the full movie, which has a lot of information in it, obviously, about the science as well. But for today, um, we're going to just show you an eight minute um, uh, snapshot of the film, which I think you'll find really relevant and helpful. And I'm going to now hand over to Michael and he's going to wave his wand and I hope it's going to work. And I'll be back in a moment. The flowers in the windy fields are small tall Our love of the ocean goes back eons. Our love of plastic, just decades. Whilst the ocean gave us the gift of life, we turned our backs and treated it with neglect. Today, our love affair with plastic is everywhere to see. But the consequences of our addiction are largely unknown. The Plastic Oceans Foundation has commissioned free diver Tanya Streeter and documentary filmmaker Craig Leeson to investigate plastic pollution in the world's oceans. This film reveals their shocking discoveries. Plastic is indestructible. We are now producing nearly 300 million tons every year, more than the combined weight of all the adult humans on the planet. Half of this plastic we use just once and throw away. We've treated the ocean as a place to dispose of things that we did not want close to where we thought we lived. Actually, the whole planet is where we live. Plastic is a blessing, but it's also a curse. It doesn't go away. It just stays and stays for decades, even centuries. Our explorers begin their quest by joining key scientific expeditions around the world. They learn how plastic causes internal damage to marine life, agonizing and often fatal. Although indestructible, plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. When mixed with plankton, the base of the food chain, it is consumed in ignorance. Every surface trawl contains plastic, and at the centers of the oceans, this plastic outnumbers plankton. While nearly half of plastic floats, the rest sinks. So what deadly threats are found lurking in the depths? What I'm interested in is when we arbitrarily plop ourselves on a flat bottom in the middle of the med, is there anything but an abyssal plane? Are we going to see bottles, plastic, cans, you know, big containers of God knows what? I don't know. Mike prepares for a deep dive off the French port of Marseille. En route au 2, 3, 0. We came upon a British flat abyssal plane, very silky, very flat. And the plastic water. A plastic bottle, exactly. We're now starting to see more and more plastic. We know so little about the deep ocean and the creatures that live there. But scientists now believe no part of its domain is untouched by the scourge of plastic. Plastic in the deep might be out of sight, out of mind, but pieces of plastic on the surface are far too tempting to ignore. Seabirds are the canaries of our oceans and the first indicators of the ocean's health. The shearwater birds that breed here on Lord Howe Island, a World Heritage Site, are in dire trouble. Seabird biologist Dr. Jennifer Lavers has dedicated her life to study them, and every visit to the island brings more and more alarming revelations. We collected something like 10 dead birds that morning. It was 
extremely depressing. Oh, look at that. Absolutely no doubt this bird died as a result of that plastic. That is literally a gut pool of plastic. It's quite alarming, isn't it? Oh, stomach's just filled with it. Big pieces too. Unbelievable. That plastic when we weighed it out accounted for 15% of that bird's body mass. If we translate that into human terms, that would be equivalent to you and I having somewhere around six or eight kilos of plastic inside of your stomach. But it's not only wildlife that's affected. Developing countries have few or no facilities to deal with plastic waste. Much of the population is forced to live among the debris of their daily lives. How much waste, plastic waste, is put into the waterways here? Do, do you have any idea? Uh, around 1,500 tons, 1,500 tons every day. Yes. Do you all live here? Yeah. So what do you do during the day? Scavenge. Scavenge. Yeah. What do you scavenge for? Plastic. Ah. And what do you do with the plastic? Go to the. Yeah. And what do they give you for the plastic? Money. Money. Our throwaway lifestyles are on the increase. Are these things an indication of what the future might hold for all of us? By the year 2050, as global populations increase, plastic production is expected to double, even triple. The frightening truth is no one even dares predict the numbers. In Germany, all packaging has been recovered since 1991. This voluntary initiative, the Green Dot System, eliminates plastic waste from the environment and nothing goes to landfill. Many countries in Europe now have progressive recycling schemes. Customers receive cash back on return bottles and the bottles are automatically sorted into their materials of origin. Plastic is then converted back into pre-production pallets to make new plastic products. When plastic reaches the ocean, the problem is more than just waste. And this is the most insidious and terrifying discovery of all. In water, plastic attracts toxins like a magnet. When marine creatures consume the plastic, the toxins are released and stored in their fatty tissues. As these toxins travel up the food chain, they become concentrated in the fish we eat. When that happens, human health is at risk. Latest science has proved that toxins associated with plastics trigger all manner of critical disease. What do you do? You can't possibly filter out these tiny particles from the entire ocean. You can't filter the entire ocean. In fact, so much plastic is in the ocean now in a form that we really can't get to it that I feel the emphasis needs to immediately shift toward stop putting it in. The plastic ocean poses a double threat, widespread polluted waste and unseen danger to the health of billions of people on this planet. Although we've come to love plastics in our daily lives, our connection to our first love, the ocean, is older and more vital. The Plastic Oceans documentary is a way to inspire people, first of all, to understand. With knowing comes caring. You might not care even if you know, but you can't care if you don't know. Thanks, Kim. If you can go to the next slide. So that's a little eight minute uh, teaser of the film, which is about, um, it's one hour and 40 minutes. And uh, if, if you are interested, even though the film is um, now four years old and it did take eight years for that film to be produced, um, Jo Ruxton, the producer spent, um, oh, she went to 23 different uh, destinations around the world to actually do the film. So I think you'll still find it very, very enlightening. Obviously there's been many films since then, uh, like. Uh, planet, the Blue Planet 2, um, Drowning in Plastic, Story of Plastic. There's lots out there now, obviously, about it. Um, but visual always gets the message across um, 
starkly and it really, really helped people to make changes. So when that film came out, people stopped, particularly with straws um, and plastic bags. There was a huge, we, we noticed that there was a big uptake for people to stop using straws and plastic bags. Um, the film's still shown in about 80 countries around the world, so um, it's amazing how much it's still being viewed. Um, our work is to change, obviously, people's perception about plastic, and our work is to stem the, stem the tide on plastic in, within a generation. So how do we do that? We have three pillars of work. One is in education, the other is business sustainability, and then everything that we do in those first two pillars is underpinned by the science and the research and is always evidence-based. So under education, um, that is where we, we are delivering. Um, we do a very comprehensive schools program, uh, community engagement program, and um, that's something that we are doing with a number of councils. Uh, councils really support the program, um, all in lots of different places. Um, we also work in New Zealand, and we've also started with some schools in Indonesia. So that's been really interesting as well. Um, but for the businesses, businesses like yourselves, um, council businesses, government entities, um, utility providers, you name it. Um, that's where we felt that there was a lot of work that we could be doing. Uh, next slide, please. So as you already know from the film, and I won't dwell on this because you've already heard lots of facts and figures from not just the film, but also from Kim, um, we, we obviously are very aware of the issue of microplastics. And that's something that we, we uh, picked up a little bit on for you here from the film about the number of, of particles floating in, in the water and how it can't be um, detected, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that there's 120 kilos of plastic per person per year uh, that's only been, uh, the, uh, um, each is, in Australia, we use each of us 120 kilograms of plastic with only 9% being recycled, which Kim touched on, which is why, um, next slide please which is why we wanted this program to be at the forefront for you to all think about um, yourselves being in council. Um, I see councils as a mini city. Um, you have uh, the power to impact change with everybody within, within the council, as in within your own staff, but also all the different um, arms and legs that go out there, like the library and the healthcare centre and the maintenance people that are out driving around doing, um, you know, maintenance or doing park, park, park work or um, uh, even just admin. You know, there's so many different areas that the council touches on. And with that, you have all these other residents coming to you using your services. So I know that I did a little bit of study, a little bit of research about Northern Territory, and I haven't been to NT for a long time, but I'm dying to get back there um, when the borders open. And um, I know the, the latest stats said that there's actually about 245,000 residents in the Northern Territory. So although, you know, compared to the rest of the population in Australia, you, you don't have millions of people like we have in our city, for example, in Melbourne, where Kim and I are, um, you still have a, a plastic footprint, which is pretty, um, pretty alarming. And you've got the most beautiful coastlines and some of the most pristine areas in the world for water and beaches. And many people do spend, live as fairly close to the water, as we know. So we felt that, um, and the microplastics and the issues on the beaches in Northern Territory, and I've, I've spoken to a number of groups, um, both community groups, um, schools that have approached me and, and some councils, that it really is an issue for you what is going on with plastic in your, in your state. So I wanted to share, the main reason I wanted to share with you this program is that I, I really feel that you could make a difference by actually um, doing something yourselves, and that is walking walking the walk and talking the talking the walk and doing the walk through the program that we are offering. Uh, next slide, please. So the EPIC program um, has been created, as I said, and it's it runs over a 12 month period. And the reason we've done that is that, like um, what Kim was saying earlier on, it takes a long time to change habits. It takes a lot of time for people to actually. Um, change what they might have been doing already for a few decades even. And we know that to get that change, you need help. So we've designed this program so that it works over a 12 month period. We have custom workshops, we have surveys, we give you access to loads of materials like the film and other films and resources so that people can actually be well armed to actually work through this process. Because 
um, because plastic, as we know, and we've said it so many times, is indestructible and it's so difficult to get rid of, it actually is a really hard challenge. Out of all of the challenges out there, you know, when we did paper recycling and, you know, returning your glass bottles or your, um, you know, aluminium cans and drinks, that that was always um, not, not so difficult. But the plastic is, is one of the most diff difficult because of all the different types of plastics and all the different um, confusion that happens for people. So, so the value proposition of going with the EPIC program makes it really simple. Um, next slide, please. So the four stages, um, and if you and you probably are wondering, and I haven't actually spelled it out, but what EPIC actually means. And I will share that with you at the end. Um, some of you might have an idea, but I'll, I will share with you what it means. Um, so over the four, the four, four periods of what we do with, with the program. In stage one, it's basically the setup, getting people in, into the zone. And that's where Kim's methodology and what she talks about with behavior change, we actually have a team. So we, we look for a team within the council that will actually be the leaders and say that they want to take up running the EPIC program internally. So this is very much a staff engagement program for you within your workplace. And it's very, it's it's geared to, to, to getting you in that zone. So we do a survey in the first um, first stage to see where everybody's at, just get a benchmark. You know, what is the norm within your organization? Are some of you aware? Are some of you not aware? Some of you very active with your plastic space. So it's just to really help to find out where everybody's at. And then we go on and we'll do an audit and we do an audit in that first stage as well. And the audit is actually to gauge how much plastic is being used and what currently are the, um, uh, the challenges with those plastics as well. We can actually weigh them and see what, what, what you've got on site. Um, that's, uh, that takes at least three months. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is actually a lot because you've got to get people all on board doing this survey returning the survey, we do an analysis of the survey, we work out and do all the hard work behind to see where everybody's at. Then we'll do the audit, which goes out to lots of different areas within your council. And you can imagine some of you may have depots and be really diverse with your areas of where you're geographically placed as well. So we, we look at all of that when we do the stage one, which is really important to get you set up with the right information and who you are where you are in your journey. Stage two is already looking at um, how we can find solutions with what your challenges are from stage one. And that includes um, your supply, your supply lists, looking at what you're using, uh, procurement, looking at um, what's been ordered and um, what you could maybe change over from those products that aren't needed. And so we look at that whole proposition of how hard would it be to change over to something else. Um, in stage three, um, and don't forget, I am skimming through this. There's a huge amount of detail and the whole toolkit with this that, that goes through everything. Um, stage three is, is actually then implementing those solutions. And that will be, you'll find that that, um, that is the hard part. It takes a bit of discussion. Uh, you're looking, we look at costing. We do cost benefit analysis for you on everything that's there um, and, and give you advice on what you could do to make it break even and then actually save you money as a council by switching over to different products. Um, stage four is... Um, looking at the wins. We, uh, we do um, awards recognition program, we'll do another audit, and we also do another survey. So we start and finish with the survey and the audit to see what the difference is when you started and when you finished. And then we also offer an extension program so that you can carry on and really, really move through the journey to looking at even different plastics, not just single use plastic, but then the hard plastics and other products, because this is all about sustainability on a big scale. Um, next slide, please. I just wanted to quickly touch on these two because these are often what we call in the too hard basket. Um, and it is about doing an audit and, and the procurement can be real stumbling box blocks for people in their workplace. And this is done as a voluntary take up from the we call them the EPIC team within your organisation. So you might have three or four people within the organisation, as I said, that want to be the lead um, to, to go single use plastic free within the organisation. And it is tough for them to do the audits without the help 
of everybody. So it's very much about that analysis with the team working together. And then we do, of course, the procurement um, listing. And we've got a, we've actually um, created a very, very detailed guide that is the first of its kind that we're aware of that actually looks at products also doing life cycle assessments. So you can actually go through and look at the energy that it that was um, used to produce that product, the amount of water, um, about your greenhouse gas emissions. And we've gone through that whole process. So you can actually really have a good look at what you're going to change over as an alternate product. But we try really hard to give you lists of products that are made in Australia or close by, you know, New Zealand and, you know, neighbouring islands, because we really try and, and reduce that footprint with the uh, with transport um, and also it does help with costs, reducing costs. So um, we will we provide all this information for you to make it really easy. And as I said before, there's a cost analysis saving that can be provided as well for the councils. And the councils are all different sizes. Obviously you've got different number of staff. Some of you are very dispersed geographically as well as um, you might not all meet up anymore. You might be working remotely, like a lot of us, you know, we haven't been together seeing each other, you know, with our team and things for, for months and months and months, and, and it might be the way it is for you there. So each council's setup is different, and that's what's really um, I think special about our program is that we've designed it to be tailor-made for each organization. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick snapshot and you can't read that very well on your screen, but just to say that um, this is just telling you what's included in the program and just zips through all those things about the four workshops. And if we are delivering a workshop to a remote area and we can't actually physically be there with a POA team representative, we actually do it online. And we do that through like what I'm doing with you today with a Zoom presentation, where we'd actually be talking to, to the team, uh, phone calls, emails, and hopefully Hopefully, eventually we will get to see you at some point during the 12 months, but depending on where you're located, um, we do not always get there in the first workshop, but we, we, we do manage really well through our videos and all the other things that we offer to get information out there like we've been doing the last several months. Um, so from that, uh, I did mention at the very bottom of this list, there's an extension program. And that is something that if a council wants to go to the next level, we do offer that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Benefits quickly, um, again, I won't take too long on this because I, I'm sure that people may have some questions. Uh, just the last couple of slides. Obviously the benefits is that it's really motivating for staff um, to be able to be part of a program where you really are doing good for the environment. You really are making a difference um, in, what you're, in what you're taking up. We found that staff love being engaged in these sorts of extra curricular activities and it has shown to reduce staff turnover because they love being involved in activities, particularly from a um, a volunteer point of view um, and of course sharing the achievements so there's awards recognition that we do with staff that have taken up and and worked really hard to get this happening for their their, their groups all the different teams out there within the departments within the departments within council. Uh, benefits, of course, to your organisation is that uh, you can lead by example. So we, at the moment, do not have any councils in the Northern Territory that have taken up our program. So my, um, my proposal and my challenge to all of you in the room today, and those listening um, via Zoom as well, is it would be wonderful if one of you wanted to step up and um, take lead by example and take on the program and have a go and see how it works for you. Um, obviously, we look at the, I call it the, we say triple bottom line, but I actually call that planet people and purpose. I don't say planet people profit because the profit comes from the purpose and from the people and from doing the right thing for the planet. So we address all of that, which then helps reduce costs. And right now, I know that everybody is trying to reduce costs and this does help reduce your costs. And then of course the benefits to the wider community. I mentioned to you about the schools program and what we do for the for community engagement. And we found that councils really like to support some of the schools out there that would like to also do the same thing. So we have what I call um, a much simplified version of this program that we deliver to schools through the curriculum as well, as well as practical activities um, that they can take out and use in their, in their local area. Um, the, 
success of what you do through your council can be shared at other public events. So you might have someone from your council speaking today that could say that they've gone single use plastic free or they have reduced dramatically what they've done in the first 12 months and they're on a journey of actually showing that they're making change. So it's all very much about that behavioural change piece, making a difference and working to show that we're really trying to do something because the time is now with what we're doing. It is really urgent for us to reduce the plastic. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to finish by letting you know that we are working with uh, some groups of councils like yourselves. So in um, New South Wales, um, the SS Rock Group, which is Southern Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils, I always forget the acronym, but I think I've got it right, which is, um, oh, it's actually on the screen there, sorry, uh, is um, they have 11 councils and they work together and that's obviously they belong to their member base like, like yourselves here with what you're doing with your group with Legant. Um, and this was a quote from Helen, this is a, a quote from Helen Sloan. And she said, this engaging program offers an innovative way to encourage government agencies to aid in a global crisis and take responsibility to curb the tide of plastic pollution entering our oceans. So Helen and her team are actually working with us right now. We've been working with them and some of their councils, and we're hoping that they're gonna lead the charge there with what they're doing. Obviously, it's been a little bit delayed because of what's happened with COVID, particularly because New South Wales, like Victoria, went into pretty uh, big, you know, shut down for a while. So we're, we're continuing on our journey there working with the team. So I just wanted to share that we are already doing this with some other councils. We're also working with Albury Wodonga, Council in Victoria and New South Wales. So that's really interesting working with two different councils, two different states at the same time. And there's uh, quite a few other smaller councils that are coming on board with us in different areas. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for you to consider and think about. And the value proposition of this is that there is no time to waste. To end on the quote from our chairman of Plastic Oceans Australasia, Tony Di Domenico, um, we have a very, very small window at the moment because of the exponential increase with PPE and the single use plastic uptake because of the pandemic um, to actually really take action and not do it in one year or two years or in five years. This has been going on for decades. And just to end on um, the last slide with Kim, if you can switch to the last slide. We, we, um, I, I wanted to let you know personally, I have lived and breathed plastic my whole life. My family had the first plastic recycling business in Victoria. And when I was a kid, only 12, 13 years old, my first job um, for pocket money on the weekends from school and things would be sorting plastic in the waste, in the yard, learning about plastics. And that's a long time ago. And I can tell you that we cannot wait any longer. We really can't wait. So I would now like to hand over, and I'm sorry if we've gone a little bit over time, um, and ask if there's any questions with our, with our audience. Thank you. A round of applause for Kim and, uh, and for Ricky as well, thanks. And were there any questions in the room, friends? Yes. Thank you. Um, hello, so my question is uh, for Kim in regards to um, uh, the behavioural sciences. Uh, in regards to the case studies you mentioned before, so the um, Starbucks example in, uh, uh, I was wondering, in, in terms of uh, case studies that you might be able to possibly recommend from your research in, in plastics, is there any maybe remote examples that we could possibly use where we are? Because uh, Starbucks um, is quite an urban um, example and sometimes rural, but in terms of our councils in these remote parts of <laughs> Australia, would mm -hmm. there be any possible case studies you might be able to recommend for education purposes if we'd like to read up on them as well? So no specific case studies uh, coming out of uh, kind of regional areas that I'm aware of, but the basic principles around financial incentives and disincentives would still apply. So if you're looking at cafes in regional areas, um, one thing which this one kind of does, the example here doesn't really touch on it. Oh, no, it does touch on. Um, one of the common behavioural approaches in cafes, whether they're in a CBD or whether they're out in a back town is to offer a discount for people who bring a reusable cup and what's really interesting is this concept of loss aversion from behavioral science which is that even if you're paying the same amount if you frame it as a discount for using a reusable 
you're not going to get as many people changing their behavior as if you frame it as a a fee for paying for the disposable. So I love that example of just a five cent fee for a disposable cup. You could do the same thing the other way around and say, you know, we'll take five cents off your coffee, charge them the same amount, and you'll get more of a behavior change from the fee than you will from the discount. Beautiful, thank you. Great. Any other questions in the room? All right, well, can we please put our hands together and thank Ricky and Kim um, for that wonderful presentation. I hope you could hear that round of applause. It was a good one. Uh, thank, you. So, yeah. thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, for having, Thanks for having us. Excellent. Uh, take care and uh, we'll see you soon. Great. Thank you. Well, friends, Bye. Oh, oh, still voices. <laughs> uh, but well, yeah, I'll you know I'll 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 hit them up when I'm in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> See you in Melbourne <laughs> yeah, at so, at some point in the future. Um, See ya. Thank you. Bye. bye. This feels like one of those um, phone calls with somebody that you really like. Like, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. I think they've all hung up. Okay, cool. It's it's always me that's last on the phone in those situations. Uh, friends, we've come to the end of day two of our wonderful uh, waste management symposium. We have another half day tomorrow full of wonderful presentations and information. Uh, and tomorrow is a Friday. So I feel like the vibe is going to have a real Friday kind of feeling. Feel free to wear a colourful shirt to really drive home the Friday vibes. Uh, that's genuinely my request. If everyone can wear something bright and colourful, that would be awesome. Uh, otherwise, could I please get you to put your hands together and thank everyone that presented today and the team for another flawless uh, day of symposium. Good work. That's all I've got for housekeeping other than oh, I should give you the time that you're here tomorrow, right? Eight thirty registration, nine o'clock first presentation. So enjoy your evening, enjoy your shopping if that's what your plans are. Uh, see you here tomorrow morning. Thanks, everyone.